Let us pray. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as you have already heard, we are talking about Sabbath this morning. And so this time before you is going to be less a proclamatory sort of sermon um, and more like a teaching time with a a time of letting you know on upcoming events in the life of our church, a big upcoming event in the life of our church, all about the topic of Sabbath. Um, And it's going to be a discussion as we learn first. So I want to ask you, first of all, and this is you Bible study people, you have to keep your mouth shut for a little bit because you already got this. Um, When you think of Sabbath, what what, what kinds of things come to your mind? What do you think of? Rest, thank you. Church, yes. Rejuvenate, that's a good one. Rejoicing, yes, thank you. Remembering, lots of re-words, which I think is right on top. I think that's exactly what Sabbath is, the re sorts of words. What else? God, I would, yes, that's a, amen. That should probably be the first word out of our mouths. We're going to think about Sabbath, we ought to be right on our good Lord, yes. Fellowship, yeah, yeah. It's funny, so Bible study, when I ask this question, um, words like blue laws came up. Now I have to admit here, blue laws are something I, I didn't really grow up with. It, it was a little bit before me. I, I think I've grown up in the, um, the ramifications of blue laws. But I didn't grow up with them being fully enacted. As far as back as I can remember, you could still go to the gas station and get gas on Sundays. Um, there were still some stores open on Sundays. R- restaurants were open on Sundays. Though at Bible study, we really talked about that understanding of Sabbath, not this renewal, fellowship, re-energizing sorts of things. We talked about Sabbath, um, and it seemed like in both Bible studies, there is um, familiarity with various Jewish acquaintances they had in their life. And it, for me, it wasn't Jewish, um, but um, Amish. Um, some parts of, 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 the, of faiths who have held Sabbath to be in very, very stringent regard. Now, I don't know if it was just what you were thinking you didn't want to say, but um, I think it's important to give a little bit of word to how Sabbath has been lived out in culture for a while. Um, so I, I did live in Columbus for a little while and in a very Jewish-centric part of Columbus. And uh, the way that those Jewish neighbors um, respected Sabbath was crazy. I mean, it was so intense Um, They had elevators in their buildings that on the Sabbath were set to stop at every floor. You know why? Because it was too much work to push the button. That was work. They were, I mean, anything involving work. They didn't cook. They didn't clean. They couldn't even open doors, some of them, because it was too much labor, too much work to put in on the Sabbath. And so they had door people that would be there on on the Sabbath to open their doors for them. They'd get to the elevator, and the doors would just open, and it'd open at every floor, so they didn't, once inside, didn't have to push the four button. Hopefully you didn't live in a real high building and have to wait like 20 floors to get off the elevator. I, I mean, around me, when I was growing up, it was the Amish communities, and the Amish communities were so dedicated to Sabbath. When it came to Sabbath, they would leave all their farming stuff to go, and they would go to someone's house, and they'd worship for like 10, 12 hours, just all day long, and when they got home that evening, they didn't go to milk the cows or do any of the work of the farm. They continued reading their Bibles and spent time as family together that night. I mean, such an overwhelming way of doing Sabbath. Now, I think that's probably not the experience for a lot of us when it comes to Sabbath. I think for a lot of us, when we think of Sabbath, it's probably not a whole lot different from the rest of the week. I mean, all of us here in preaching to the choir are here in church on Sunday. And maybe our Sunday afternoons is some family time. I know, I've heard that from stories among many of us. That's a family time. Um, but I wonder if, if in many other ways, Sabbath looks different from the rest of our week. If it looks different from the sort of consumer-driven, um, results-driven world we live in. I think probably not. I, I was thinking in particular this week about, I mean, so many of our folks in our congregation are retired I wonder, um, in retired life, if Sunday looks different from the other days of the week. I don't know. Let's take a moment look in the Scriptures for Sabbath. Um, 
for as, as little as we regard Sabbath in our culture today, it is not smallly regarded in the scriptures. You don't need to read very far in your Bible to get to the first story of Sabbath. In fact, you will find it where? In the first chapter, Genesis. The very first model given for creation is God. And God has a way of operating where God works for six days, and then God stops working on the seventh day. And some people use the word rest. I'm not really sure that that's what God does, but I know this, one, the Hebrew word is a little bit more ambiguous than just simply rest. Um, but I think it's these re-words, renews, re-energizes, rejuvenates. First chapter, and it's not just some guy, it's God doing it. And a little line I like to always say to our Bible study people is if, if God does it, it's probably what we should be doing too. If it's good enough for God, maybe it's good enough for us. Okay, so we see it in the first chapter of the scriptures, but it doesn't take long for this theme to become foundational as we move along. We know the stories of, of Genesis, the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. We know that Jacob, by the end of Genesis, is stuck in Egypt, slaves. And all of, the, all of our ancestors, all of the Hebrew people, are stuck as slaves in Egypt. Um, and so Exodus begins with this great movement of God coming to the rescue of God's people and leading them out of their slavery. And we know the story. We've watched Charlton Heston live it out. We know that they get to Mount Sinai and that Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and, and God gives the people the law. And the law has um, this amazing great purpose. The law is intended for the people to know what it looks like to be God's people. They're not meant to be restrictive or to grind the people down or to make sure God's up here and people are down here. In fact, the way God begins the conversation is by saying, hey, I am your God and you are my people. And this is what it means to be my people. And so, in that law, what's the third thing we read? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it sanctified. Keep it holy. Keep it set apart. Keep it different from all the other days. And you know why that is so foundational? You know why it's third in the line? Think about where these people just came from. They just came from Egypt. And you know what they were doing in Egypt? They were working they were making bricks, most of them. And you know how many off days they had in their brick-making work? None. You know how many Sabbath days they had? You know how much rest they had? You know how much renewal, rejuvenation? None. Do you see how amazing this commandment, this law, this gift God gives to Israel is? And it winds up being that all through the Old Testament, if we read the Old Testament, God continues to remind God's people, don't be seduced into this culture of the world sort of way. Don't be seduced into the consumerism sort of way of Egypt or Babylon or wherever you find yourselves. If you want to be different, if you want to be my people, continue at the most foundational level to remember, remember Sabbath. Remember Sabbath and you will be different from everyone else around you. And so, um, of course, in Jesus we see this too, right? Um, we don't see it necessarily quite as explicit. There's, it doesn't say, and Jesus went... And, and Jesus stopped all of his working and on the Sabbath rested for the whole day or was in the act of renewal. But we do see him regularly going to the synagogue to be with people as they're worshiping, a Sabbath ritual. We see him regularly going off by himself to pray, avoiding the crowds. And, and he vanished through the crowds and went off on a mountain by himself to pray. On the night in which he is about to be taken, where do we find him? Sabbath, in the midst of prayer and meditation. I mean, do, you see, do you see how foundational this is in the scriptures? It isn't, it isn't just something that you may find helpful in your life. It's not something that, we, oh, we really hope you do it. God isn't wishing that you might find this as part of your life. It is law because it is necessary for our health and our well-being. All right, so there's the teaching sort of thing. I don't have a smooth transition for this, but among our council, we have talked about this idea of rest and Sabbath among our church and for our church, and we have recognized that this is a tough thing to talk about with people. Um, we Americans have this idea that, if, uh, that we should be valued by the amount of work we do for things, and um, the less rest makes a person more worthy in the sight of our culture. Um, you know, it, even among stupid pastors, um, I hear, my, I, it's come out of my mouth and out of my colleagues that, you know, like, well, I haven't taken an off day in like two months. It's, yeah, it's 
see how hard I'm working? Um, and, and it gets extrapolated over into all facets of the world, not just the secular, or not just the sacred, the secular. We hear people talking about how they haven't had a day off in, in weeks, if not months, about how they've just worked a 70 or 80 hour week. <sighs> the beauty is the scriptures call us to, an, invite us to a different way of life that's better for us. And so we as council have been talking about this, and we've engaged in this conversation with a few people, and it's been met by some hesitancy because the council must not think I'm doing enough or must think there's something wrong with me if they're asking me to take a rest. Um, and so things in my own life have kind of come to a head in the last two years, and I kind of recognized that I needed to take an intentional um, Sabbath, an intentional sabbatical. And our church encourages its clergy and its people to take Sabbath regularly, um, and so we have been going through the paperwork and going through the process of looking into a sabbatical um, for myself. And the goal initially was, partly because I was in such a difficult place at the time, to take a sabbatical this summer of 2016. Then we found out that there is huge grant money out there for people, pastors, and for congregations to faithfully jump into the process of a sabbatical. Um, and so the council and myself have been putting together a proposal, um, a, a big grant proposal, um, for myself and for my family and for all of us to go through a season of sabbatical in the summer of 2017. Um, and so the grant proposal is due in April, and we are engaging in this right now. Um, and so I, uh, a couple of things I want to say about that is it's not just me going to leave for three months or for two months, or I'm, do, I'm not just going to stop working and be on vacation. Um, we've already said that's not what Sabbath is about. Sabbath is about renewal and rejuvenation. And so this time will be about renewal and rejuvenation and revisioning for our church, for myself, and for my family, and for all of you. Um, to give a real, out, real quick sketch of what I think this will look like and what we're applying for, um, the first month of it, it will begin right after school's out because can you believe my wife doesn't want me leaving while school's in? She doesn't want to be a single mom while trying to take two kids to school. She's so lazy. <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, she's not here. <laughs> <laughs> we have a weekend without the kids, and she just is like barely able to move. She's just so exhausted. Um, so the first month will be a pilgrimage that I plan on taking, of biking 1,100 miles, um, and just doing a real pilgrimage, all centered around prayer and spirituality. I've, um, in, my, in the last two years of kind of hitting the wall, I've kind of realized that I didn't have a real great foundational prayer life for lots of reasons. I'd be glad to tell you all about those if you want. And I've also come to the conclusion that I feel like a lot of us our community are in the same boat as what I was. I'm not a unique kind of weirdo in that reality. And so I want to spend a month of, of traveling, pushing myself to physical extremes, but also making regular, in, um, regular intervals of time to stop and pray. I um, mean, so our church has this great gift called the Divine Office Hours. You've heard me talk about this probably before, and I like to talk about it. And it's this system of praying where monks for 1,500 years have stopped every three hours and just prayed. And there's a liturgy that goes at every three-hour interval. And so I'm going to use that as a foundation of my um, time. I've started seeing a spiritual director, and she's going to help me guide this time as we anticipate that also. Um, and so just to have this pilgrimage time by myself. Um, Stacy and the kids will be here, and I will be um, biking across the eastern part of the country. Um, and then uh, take a week to come back and kind of um, discern and, and marinate over all those things that just happened to me. And then we're going to spend a couple weeks just as family, kind of translating those spiritual practices into something that's sustainable for our family. And then I'm going to come back for a month and spend time, not quite back at House of Prayer yet, but thinking and praying and putting together a five-year plan for what this spirituality thing that I've figured out about myself, how, what that looks like for our church. Because again, I feel like this is a struggle for all of us as Lutherans. We are very head people and not very good heart, feeling, emotional for people. We're not very good at vulnerability either. Um, and so I want to put together a five-year plan on what that looks like for us moving into the next five years when I get back. And um, our ministry of spiritual education, or Christian education spirituality, um, we're going to work on that together when I get back. And then the council is going to gather around that and hopefully be able to put together some sort of real tangible thing that we can all invest ourselves in. Um, one thing I heard from someone, someone on, on a, a faithful thank you person on council was that hearing me talk about this made them think um, about other pastors who have um, gone on longer vacations or longer, longer times away and then came back and surprised the church with, oh, I'm leaving. Um, and I want to address that up front. That is not, I don't feel that in my heart right now. I don't feel like God is calling me or our family to leave House of Prayer. 
and in fact, quite the opposite. Um, and that's why I think some intentional Sabbath time and sabbatical would be really good for me and uh, my family and for us all. Um, and so the goal is with the grant to have a full interim pastor here while I'm gone for those, that time. So you have the same um, face in front of you preaching and helping to be here for things and leading Bible studies and F3 and helping our ministries continue to grow and move forward. Um, and I really, um, we're going to work on ways of keeping the congregation involved in that pilgrimage that I'm on and the journey the whole way throughout those three months and really um, starting a new era of House of Prayer beyond that. Um, so that's where we are with, the, with a, kind of a big thing that the council and I have been wrestling with lately. And I've been talking about it in Bible studies in small groups, but not everybody's part of small groups. Maybe that'll be something we'll work on. Um, so it's not a very sermonly sort of thing to do or a preaching sort of thing to do. But do you have any questions? After I just told Jeff no questions earlier about something else. <laughs> well, the dialogue is on um, to, to begin this dialogue and, and to continue having a sense out for what is best for all of us together as we go through this. This isn't a sabbatical for Pastor Mike. This is a Sabbath for all of us. Um, and I really, uh, it is my prayer that uh, we all do this together and we all engage in this together. Um, and so it gives me excitement now to pass this all off and extend the, those who know about it from just myself and the council to now all of us as we journey together. Um, let us take a moment and pray. God, you call us from the very beginning of scriptures to a life of balance, a life of working hard and, and giving ourselves intensely to what you call us to do. And then you call us just as intensely to be renewed and to be refreshed and to take time and step back so that we can be even more energetic for what you call us to do when we come back at it. I think we all find the idea of sabbatical and of Sabbath as we see it in Genesis and Exodus and all through the scriptures, to be a really radical idea, um, a difficult one given the culture that we live in. But I feel like it was just as difficult for those ancient Israelites as they were told on Mount Sinai that they needed to abide by Sabbath when they just come from a culture of working nonstop. Continue to break our hearts at here at House of Prayer and in Aliquippa and across our country to be people that don't find our value by how much we work but by how engaged we are in the world and with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.